about 30 odd years ago, I was uh, a member of a Baptist church uh, elsewhere in London. And it was one of these churches with a sloping floor and uh, with pews that went all the way round. And uh, one week we had builders in to take the floor out and to put in chairs instead of pews. Now I was not sort of part of the leadership, sort of unofficially part of the leadership in, in the church. And I remember that first Sunday when we, uh, when we started back, people turned up early. They were desperate to make sure that they got their chair in exactly the same position that they'd sat in in their pew for the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. At the next members meeting, there was a resolution that there had to be studs placed in the floor, in the carpet, to make sure that the chairs went into exactly the same place each week. You know, that's a picture of our Christian lives for some people. If you like, it's a metaphor, a, a picture of what our Christian life is like. We, we get so used to being in the same pattern, in the same direction, doing the same things, we just go on doing that time after time. Well, this morning, what I've got to share with you is a challenge. As we begin 2015 together, it's a challenge on a number of levels. But for some of you, it's a challenge that it's time to change direction. It's time to change what you have been doing serving God with your Christian life. Because what you have been doing has been right. But a time of change is coming. Now, I'm going to be speaking from over here for a while this morning, so you might want to turn your chairs around, or you can uh, look over your shoulder, um, whichever, you, uh, whichever you prefer. <laughs> Father God, thank you that you are a God of movement, and you are a God of change. Thank you that our journey with you in the Christian life is described as a pilgrimage. And we start from one place, and we go to somewhere else, and it means change all the way through. Father God, as we come to look at your word this morning, I want to ask for every single person who is here and every single person that's subsequently watching this on the internet, that we hear your word into our lives. Not just your general word, Father God, that we're going to look at from scripture, but your specific word into our lives in this situation, in this context that we find ourselves in today. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to stay over here, by the way. <laughs> but I'm not going to the front at all. Okay, turn with me to Matthew 25, please. You turn to Matthew chapter 25. Uh, if you happen to have one of our purple uh, church Bibles, you'll find it around page uh, 994. Matthew 25, and we're, we're going to be beginning at verse 14. It's a well-known parable. Uh, in fact, it's a favorite parable in Sunday school. Because it's you know, sort of, on the surface, it's a nice story. Actually, underneath the surface, it's not a nice story at all. But we'll get to that a little bit later on. It will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. Now in this whole section of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God, that area where God is in charge. The kingdom of God is about the area, not the geographical area just, but the area where God is in charge. He's teaching about the kingdom of God. And he's also in particular teaching about the time when he is going to return. He's got his eye a long way in the future. And about the fact that when he returns, people, if you're a person, could you put your hand up? Thank you. People are going to be judged for the way that they have lived their lives when Jesus returns. 
That doesn't just apply to non-Christians, by the way. The Bible is very, very, very clear that I and you as Christians, we also will be judged for the way that we've lived our lives. Not a question of whether we're saved or not. That is settled when we put our faith and trust in Jesus. But there is a judgment. And for Pastor Warren, for me, for John, for Timmy, for Steve, for Andy, for Liz, that judgment's going to be stricter, by the way. Because anyone who teaches God's word, the judgment will be stricter for them. The Bible's very clear on that. So welcome to the club, ladies and gents. So it's going to be like a man going on a journey who gave talents to his servants according to their ability. Verse 16. The man who'd received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who'd received the one talent went off. He dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who'd received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So two of these servants took the talents that the master had given them. Remember here that the master stands for Jesus. So they took the talents that they had received and they put them to good work. And they were eager to see their master when he returned. You're eager to meet Jesus when he returns? Hello? You eager to meet Jesus when he returns? They were eager. They were very, very eager. Now, here's the interesting thing. Now, in human terms, if Jesus had been uh, you know, responding to them in the way that people are judged in our society at the moment, the one that got the five talents, he would have got a special reward, a special honour, because he'd got five more. The other one had gone to, well, you know, yeah, you did quite well, but you only made two. Do you notice anything about what Jesus said to the two of them? Have a look. Word for word, the same. You see, the standard that we're going to be judged by is not success in human terms. Did you make five or did you make two? The standard is how faithful have you been with what God has given you? I sometimes hear people, I was going to use the word bleat, but perhaps I'll do that. I sometimes hear, hear people bleating to me, but, but pastor, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot of gifts. I, I can't pray like, you know, some of you pray. I can't teach the Bible like some of you teach the Bible. I can only. Yeah, well, you can only do what God's given you to do. Serving God. And it doesn't matter whether it seems a great big thing. It's no more special because it seems a big thing than if God's given you something that seems a small thing. The issue is, are you faithful in doing what God is asking you to do? Are you faithful in using what God has given you? That's the criteria. Story's all right so far, isn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. But this, you see, when Jesus tells parables, um, there, there usually is a, like a bite point in the parable. And this is it. Then the man who'd received the one talent came. Master, he said, 
I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown, gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. This servant's afraid. Fear kept him from using what his master had given him. Now, have a think for a moment. What do you think he might have been frightened of? What do you think? As always, by the way, when I ask questions, just because I'm standing in a slightly different place, and it's going to be harder to get to you, I'm still going to wander around with the microphone. I might tread on a few toes, literally, <laughs> kick a few mugs over, but that's okay. Um, he's frightened of failure and like judgment and punishment, I think. So can you, can you unpack that? Frightened of failure? Failure of what? Um, he's afraid that if he invests it, he won't get a return on it, and he'll get punished for doing that. Okay, so there's two fears there. There's a fear of failure and a fear of punishment. Yeah, okay, what else have we got? He was afraid of actually losing that one talent. So he preferred to keep it and give it back. Yeah, so he was afraid of losing it. You know, if, if I invest it and, you know, I make a bad decision, I'm going to lose it. I see, is your hand up or down? It's up, that's okay. It's just a bit difficult to tell from over here. Um, maybe he was lazy. So he's like, I'll just bury it and, you know, get on with my life. Yeah. Mm. Maybe he was lazy. I see a hand all the way over there. Now, that's going to be an interesting challenge. I think we'll just have to make a way through here. Uh, by the time I come back, can you make that chair disappear for me? Um, thank you very much. Yeah, see what you can do. So see if you can use your talents in chair moving. Um, I'm agreeing with Joe. Um, he might not have wanted to get involved too much which meant he's out of his usual comfort zone and it's not good and he just wants to make sure that he can return what he was given without too much bother. Mm. You know the 80-20 rule, don't you? You know the 80-20 rule about organisations? 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. <laughs> Sorry? As John said, if you're lucky. If, <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of people... A lot of people choose simply not to get involved. And this is what the master, um, remember, this is Jesus speaking here. This is what he said. You wicked, lazy servant. You knew that I harvest where I've not sown, gather where I've not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more. He will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Maybe this servant felt unworthy of the talent which really is saying God's made a mistake can I just say that again maybe he felt unworthy of the talent I get people say that to me sometimes but yeah I don't I don't really feel worthy well there's a sense in which we're not any of us worthy but when God gives us a gift if we say well we're not fit to use it we're calling God a liar, saying God's made a mistake. Maybe he was afraid of making a mistake himself. He had a wrong idea of his master. You know, I, I think, this is a David Wise theory, I think if he'd gone and put it to work and he'd lost it, and he went to his master and said, Master, I've got nothing. I did try, I did this, I did that but it didn't work out. His master would have said to him, thank you for trying. Here's another talent. 
go and have another go. The issue was, as Joe put it here, he, part of it was that he was, according to God, was lazy. He was selfish. Selfish is what we are when God gives us something to give to somebody else and we keep it to ourselves. So I'll say that again. Selfish is what we are when God gives us something to give to somebody else and we keep it for ourselves. Selfish. And the taking away of it there, it's, it's a principle that um, you see in nature all the time. I, I expect, I'm not going to go around and ask, but I expect that a number of you here have broken an arm or broken a leg at some stage and had it in plaster. And, and when, that, when that plaster comes off, you have a bit of a shock because you've got one arm bigger than the other. What's happened is one arm's been doing nothing, just hanging limply in a, in a, in a cast for a while, and the, the muscle atrophies, is the technical term, it shrinks. The other arm's been doing double work, so it's got much, much bigger. So the plaster comes off and you've got one puny little arm over here, and one great big thing, and it's the same with the legs apparently, you, you know, same thing, you end up, you look down, you've got one matchstick and one tree trunk. The principle's there in nature. What doesn't get used atrophies and wastes away. What gets used grows stronger. It's the same principle here, in case you think he's being hard done by. Okay, turn with me. Let's leave that parable, mixture of good news and bad news. And let's go and have some just unremitting good news. Is that all right for a while? Yeah. Yeah. No, notice for a while, because there is a challenge coming later. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12. It's a really well-known passage, and, and I'm, I'm not actually saying anything to you this morning, other than when I get to the very end, that I've not said to you before. So some of you think, now, I'm sure Pastor David said this to me before. I probably have. And it might have been here on a Sunday morning or it might have been in one of the workshops that we've been running over the last few years on uh, reaching your potential. How many have been in one of those workshops, reaching your potential workshop? Yeah, there's a few hands sort of around. We run them every now and then. So, um, yeah. So let's, let's begin at uh, verse 4. Good morning. So I'm just getting a smile from someone else sitting on the floor down here, so, uh, who you can't see, so looking at me and smiling, so that's nice. Verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Let's read verse 7 together. You ready? It, no matter what version you've got, if your version's different, just read what you've got there. Verse 7, 1, 2, 3. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To how many? Any exceptions? Are you sure? Look around the room. Have a look around. Is there, are there any exceptions in the room here? Are you an exception? So that means that God has what? Hello? Given you what? Given you gifts. No exceptions? Can you just turn to three or four people around you and say, God has gifted you? See, I, I don't care whether you like it or not. I don't care whether you agree with it or not. The fact is, God has gifted you. You are gifted by God. Amen? Amen. And there are no exceptions. Whatever you think of yourself, whether you think you're a complete piece of rubbish, that's not how God sees you. 
God sees you. God's invested in you. God's put gifts in you. God's put his spirit inside of you. God's made you his son and his daughter. And he doesn't have rubbish sons and daughters. He just has princes and princesses. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's drop down to verse 12. Anybody brought their body with them this morning? Anybody brought their body with them this morning? Excellent. That's really handy because we're going to use the body as a visual aid. So I'm glad you brought yours along this morning because uh, this is about the body. Verse, the rest we're going to look at this morning from verse 12 down to verse 27 is all about bodies. The body is a unit. Is your body all joined up together? Any bits disconnected? Now just wiggle those toes, it's still all there? Excellent. The body is a unit. Though it's made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, we form one body. So it is with Christ. We were all baptised by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Let me read a quote to you from a guy called Bittlinger. In order to accomplish his work on earth, Jesus had a body made of flesh and blood. In order to accomplish his work today, Jesus has a body that consists of living human beings. So if you are a Christian, you are born again, you are a part of the body of Christ. You are a part of, the body of Christ is an image, it's a metaphor, it's a picture of church. You are a part. And it's a united body. Now we're of a diverse bunch this morning. Look around. What a bunch of weirdos. <laughs> whole mixture we come from different countries we're of different ages we've got different physical attributes different levels of fitness we've got different levels of academic ability we're a mixed bunch But we're all part of the same body. We have far more in common with one another than we have that is different from one another. Because we were baptised into the same body. We share the same Holy Spirit in our lives. Baptised, given to drink, their images are being immersed in, overwhelmed, inside and out. So it means that the previous distinctions are no longer relevant. Now, now we illustrate this in church every week, and you, you may not actually have ever appreciated this. But have you ever asked the question, why we have flags that, that mark the different nationalities only on three sides of the church? Have you ever asked your question, why on earth did Pastor David have this idea of putting these flags on three sides? We're running out of space, are we going to have flags on the fourth? The answer is no. Why not? Because on the fourth, we had the mark of what joins us together. This is about our difference and distinctiveness. And it's great that we're such a mixture, isn't it? So many different people from so many different backgrounds with different strengths, different weaknesses. What a, di- what a mixed up bunch we are. That's great. But what we have in common is what unites us. We are members of God's household. We share in the same Holy Spirit through what Jesus did on the cross for us. We have more in common than divides us. In Paul's day, there were Two different sets of distinctions. There was a religious distinction between Jew and Greek. Huge social divide between those two groups. And some Christians came from 
Jewish backgrounds, some came from a Greek background. The other was a social distinction between slave or free. In those days, you either were owned by somebody or you owned other people. You were either slave or free. And the majority were slaves. They were actually owned by other people. And so in the church, you'd have a mixture. Some of the people that, that were, were together with their brothers and sisters when they met together, some of them were slaves. Some of them were slave owners, the free men. But when they met together, they had more in common in Jesus than divided them. Now we could go around, I'm not going to do it, but we could go around and we could try and identify some of the differences among us today. I've, I've highlighted a number of them. You could probably make an even longer list. But the fact is we have more in common than divides us. Our unity is because of our common experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. We have more in common than divides us. So let's look down and look through the rest of this chapter. Remembering that this is a picture about church, about us. So verse 14. Now the body's not made up of one part, but of many. Quick look down, just check. Got your body with you? Lots of different parts. Yeah? If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. Romans 12, let me uh, turn back and read to you from a few verses from Romans chapter 12 from verse 4. Just as each of us has one body with... Wet, with Mm, do that again. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. That goes a bit against our European culture, doesn't it? To put it mildly. Did you hear that? Each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. Then there's a list of the gifts. If that's your gift, use it. Whatever it happens to be. Sometimes people feel, ah, oh, I don't matter. You know, it doesn't really matter whether I'm a part of church or not a part of church. It doesn't really matter whether I turn up or don't turn up. But I'm really not needed. I wonder when you woke up in bed this morning, assuming that you were in bed when you woke up. Of course, you might have fallen asleep in your chair last night for all I know. But, but wherever it was when you woke up this morning, I wonder how it would be if your knees said to you, Oh, I'm really not very important. I'm, uh, I'm not going to church with you this morning. You can go by yourself. It would be a slightly awkward journey to church, wouldn't it? What if, what if when you woke up this morning, your elbow said, I don't like being an elbow. I'm going to be a nose today. <laughs> Would have made eating breakfast interesting, wouldn't it? Do 
you notice any application to us as church here? You see, God gives us different places, different gifts, different abilities. And uh, if we decide we don't matter, or actually if we don't like what God has given us and we decide we're going to be something else, we actually deprive the whole of the body of something. Because every bit's important. So on the one hand, this is amazing. Every single one of you has been gifted by God. Amen? Every single one of you has been given a place within God's family, within his household. Amen? Isn't that amazing? But with such amazing things also comes some responsibility. You could actually say to your knee this morning, come on, you've got a job to do. How am I going to get down the road if you're going to stay in bed this morning? Or to your elbow, how am I going to eat my breakfast if you're a nose? And that's precisely the point that Paul is making here about church, about you and me. And have you also noticed when you came to church this morning, at least I hope this is true of you, if not we'll pray for you after, all of your body came with you. It wasn't you got halfway to church and your foot said, actually this morning I'm going to go and do such and such by myself. Did that happen to anybody this morning? There is this sense of being a part of something else together. Uh, I have a quote here, uh, it's from a guy called Pryor writing on this passage, talking about the body, talking about church, and he says this, independent operators reduce both their own and the body's effectiveness. You see, if your foot had gone off and done its own thing, it wouldn't have been very successful by itself, I'd like to suggest. And neither would you have had a very easy journey to church if your foot had naffed off somewhere else, doing its own thing. That phrase back in Romans about us being members of one another, there is, there is a responsibility and accountability to one another within the body. As there is within your physical body, so there is within the church also. Still with me? Still got your body here? Excellent. Let's, uh, let's read a bit more. Verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part... Where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the hand cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. Every part is needed. How many parts are needed? Is your part needed? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. We're all needed because that's how God designed us. There's also no place for attitudes of superiority or, or ideas of self-sufficiency. The idea of a lone Christian just doesn't appear in the Bible. Because God made us to be interdependent, not independent. All of us. And no self-sufficiency, which is really about pride. So let's think about where we've got to for a moment before we come into the next bit. So what do you think this sort of image, these images here, how does this, what does it look like, do you think, in practice here? within 
within this church family. Can you give me some illustrations of what this does mean or what it might mean for us before we come on to the next bit? I see those hands. I'm glad you brought your hands along this morning. Uh, it means that uh, we all have a responsibility uh, to use whatever God, uh, whatever gifts God has given to us. It means exactly what I was going to say, that we all have a responsibility to use the gift God has given to us. If one person refuses to use the gift God has given to them for the body, then the body will be lacking that gift. Anything else? We should feel like we need each other rather than being selfish and being on our own. Very good. I saw a hand somewhere. I didn't quite catch where it was. I say I can't function. I can't function as a Christian without you guys. I need you all, and you need me. That's so important and profound. I'd like you to say that again. I say I can't function without you people, you guys, and I can't. And, and I need you, and you need me. Very good. Very good. I see a hand over there. I can't quite work out who it's attached to yet, but um, it's probably it's attached to somebody because it's uh, it's body. I'll try not knock the camera over when I'm going past. Uh, because God has given us different gifts, we have to share the, those gifts among the members, whatever God has given to each one of us. Very good, thank you. I watched recently a man giving testimony about his daughter having cancer, and um, he was saying that he was calling out to God, like, where are you? Where are you in this situation? And God said to him, um, look at me, I'm in the mosaic of the faces of all the people that are around you, the doctors, the nurses, the congregation, everybody praying for you. That's where I am. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. Great image. Anybody else? Okay, one more. Um, well, I'm just going from um, scripture, well, not just, um, in Galatians, I'm not sure, chapter and verse, but it says that when we come together, we should all uh, come with something from God to share, a psalm, a song, a testimony, you know, an encouragement for, for one another. So we don't just come as to take, we come to give. Absolutely, yeah. How is it with you, brothers, when you come together? Every one of you has a hymn, a song, a word to share together. Okay, let's go on. Verse 22, 1 Corinthians 12. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those parts that we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honour to the parts that lacked it. So there should be no division in the body, but that its part should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. You know, some of our most vulnerable and weakest parts of our bodies are deep inside us. Most of your external bits, if you happen to have them cut off, you'd still manage to live. The head's an exception, but you know arms and legs, you could still manage to live without one or two of those. I'm not recommending that as a lifestyle choice. I'm just saying that's true. But some of those bits that you can't see that are tucked away on the inside, without one of those, you'd be dead pretty rapidly. You don't see them. You don't notice them. Anybody here seen their heart? Pretty important. Oh, you've seen it on x-ray, yeah. 
Yeah. Some other organs tucked away there that are really, really important. But without them, we'd be dead. You see, apparent weakness, the reason those bits are away is because they need protection. Apparent weakness has got nothing to do with significance, with value. Neither is visibility. The fact that you see me when I'm here on a Sunday because I'm either at the front talking, praying, or I'm preaching. I'm, I'm very visible. You go to the website, you have the joy of one of the first things you see being my smiling face looking at you. That doesn't mean that my role or my place is any more important, any more significant than anybody else. It just means I'm more visible. Our sexual organs are kept covered up. And yet they're vitally important. The human race wouldn't last very long if we didn't have them. Degree of visibility has no relationship whatsoever to actual value. In fact, God has so designed our bodies that it's the hidden bits that tend to have the most important functions. It's part of God's strategy for deepening genuine relationships, preventing discord. Let's, let's think for a moment. This is the last question that I've got. So it's your last opportunity to answer a question this morning. Think about us here, church family here. Can you think about some things that you don't see that are really important functions within the life of the church here that you don't see? So this is not about me and Pastor Warren, but what you don't see? The cleaning of the building. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Anybody ever seen the building being cleaned? One or two of us, yeah, important, very important thing that happens. If it wasn't, we'd be in all sorts of trouble very soon. I did see a hand briefly. I just didn't see it long enough to see whose it was. The administration part of running a church. Yeah, that goes on. Yeah, we wouldn't have any gas or electric apart from anything else without administration. That's really important. What other things? There are some other really profound, important things. People that go out and visit maybe sick people and things like that that, you know, can't get to church or whatever. Yeah, so that caring, that pastoral caring that's done away with people who are ill, who are poorly, nobody sees that, nobody hears about that. That's really important. Yeah. Uh, the prayers of our senior members. Prayers, yes. Prayer, and senior members in particular and others as well. That, the whole area of prayer is vitally important. And yes, we do pray here on a Sunday morning but I hope that a lot more prayer goes on during the week than we actually have here on a Sunday morning and some of the most profound prayers in this church are people you do not see at the front on a Sunday morning very very good I saw another hand over here yeah the sharing of good news with our friends relatives neighbors that kind of thing we don't see that yeah. very very good The work that is done by the judge premises management team. Mm -hmm. we, just, we just see things happen, but they've been working behind the scenes. Very good. There are some other bits that I, I, we haven't got yet. That Somebody has to pay the bills and stuff like that. Yeah, somebody has to pay the bills. <laughs> what, about, what about encouragement? You know, the, the, the ministry of encouragement that quietly goes on. There was... There was a, a phase here a few years ago um, uh, when I was the only uh, person doing pastoral work here. Um, it, it, it happened over a several week period. I noticed I, I went to see a number of people who had really difficult circumstances, really difficult things that happened to them. Every single one, someone else in the church who I won't name, had already, before I'd even got there, had been around with a card, with some flowers, with some expression of just love for that person. Someone who 
Don't come to the front, someone that's not visible, but just very quietly going around encouraging people quicker than I could get there. It's amazing. And again, it's, it's that hidden thing that's so very, very important. If we don't see encouragement going on within our church family, we're soon going to be in difficulty. What else? Anything else? Out, outreach missions and overseas missions that we go on. Mm-hmm. Very good. Okay. Oh, one more. The invisible friendship that's going on, supporting each other. I, I thought, yeah, that's really important. I thought you might talk about the amazing work that happens outside here each Sunday with those children down the other end of the building. When I saw your hand go up, I thought you were going to mention that because that, you know, that goes on out of our sight. But it is, it's hidden away, but it's such an important piece of work that happens each week with the children here in creche, in Sunday club, not forgetting the young people, the work that goes here on a Sunday morning and also during the week. Lots of things that, that go on as well. So... In, uh, in, this, in this context, why am I uh, talking about all of this this morning? So um, the question is, what, what really do, do we need to do in the context of this? What do we need to do? Why have I felt that God has given me this for this morning? Thank you, Pastor. Well... You know, I, I think that for many of us who are here, we need to begin to use the gifts that God has given us. That's one of the challenges. There are two challenges, and that's the first one. I, I don't want you to answer this out loud, but I want you to answer this to yourself. One question, part A, part B. Part A, what are you personally currently doing to serve within the Greenford Baptist Church family? I don't want an answer out loud. I just want you to think about the answer to that question. What are you personally currently doing to serve God within the Greenford Baptist Church family? Part B, what are you doing currently to serve God by serving this community in which we are set? And those are equally important questions because God has called us to serve this community around us. So think about that. Answer those questions to yourself. What are you currently doing to serve God within the Greenford Baptist Church community, family, And what are you currently doing to serve God in our community? Have a think about that. I'm not going to ask you to tell me. I want you to think about it. Make a list for yourself. Now, the second thing I want to say, the second challenge is particularly addressed to you if you have been a Christian for some years. If you're a new Christian, just listen But if you've been a Christian for some years, this is a challenge particularly for you. And this is what it about this sort of moving around this morning. Remember I began with this story at the beginning. Absolutely true story of this church that had the new floor and the new chairs. I'll tell you just one other quick story before I make the challenge. Again, true story. Happened to a friend of mine. He's preaching in his big church. And the communion table's in the middle of the platform. And he, like me, walks around a lot when he's speaking. So a Christian brother's passing by. He said to him, excuse me, he said, can you help me move the communion table? Now, I'm not making this up, all right? This actually happened, absolutely true. He looked at him and said, I'm, I'm really sorry, he said. Um, I have the gift of speaking in tongues. You need somebody with the gift of helps.
Those of you who've been around for some time, you almost certainly are doing some things currently serving God within this church family or within the community. We as a leadership team strongly believe that this year, 2015, is a year of change. It's been the word that God has had constantly on, uh, on us over the last six months as we've been thinking into this year. Prophetically, through Bible readings, in all sorts of different places and ways, it's about change. And part of that change is about us changing what we're doing with the gifts that we have. Now, we can be very comfortable. That was the problem with this, these people in this church. They were lovely Christian people. Um, some of the most traditional of them were in the house group that I led in this church. Can you imagine me ended up leading the most traditional house group in the church? Yeah, well, there we go. Um, you know, but they, they were so fixed in what they were doing. The pastor told me, he said, uh, when I started here, he said, we had, a, we had an over-18s group that met on a Sunday night. He said, they've been meeting for 25 years. The youngest was in their 50s. <laughs> but we can be like that. We can be very comfortable in what we're doing. It would be much more comfortable and straightforward. I mean, this is a trivial thing. You've just had to move a few chairs around or, or get a crick in your neck when you're trying to see, where's that wretched pastor gone now? But I want you to remember this because this is a challenge for you. Is this a time for change for you? Have you been comfortable doing what you are doing? Yes, you've been obedient to God. But now God is calling you to use your gifts in a different way. And maybe this is a challenge for you. And maybe you need to be obedient to God by taking some risks. You see, when you're doing what you've always been doing, you usually know you're good at it. And it's okay. You've been teaching in Sunday club for years. You've been on the washing up rotor. You've been welcoming people on Sunday mornings when they arrive in our building. You've, you've been whatever for years. And you're good at it. And you're comfortable in it. And it's not been wrong that you've been doing that. But the challenge is, as you come into this year, does God want you to go on doing the same thing? If the answer is yes, fantastic. You get on and you do that. But if it's not, maybe it's time to take a risk. To do something you've never done before. Joining those others who've never done anything before and are about to take a risk. Let's pray, shall we? I'm going to be silent now for a couple of minutes because I want to give you an opportunity to talk to God. So I'm going to stop talking altogether and I'm going to pray in a few moments. Father God, I thank you for the way that you have gifted us. Every single one of us who's a part of your family, you have gifted us. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you've gifted us. Thank you that you put your Holy Spirit inside us. It's, it's not just that you've given us something and told us to get on with it. You put your Holy Spirit inside us to enable us and strengthen us. Thank you that you speak to us. Father God, help us as we move into 2015 to be using the gifts that you have given us in the way you want us to be using them. And if it means change, taking those changes. If it means doing stuff for the first time, taking that risk. Father God, help us to be those people who are doing what you want us to do when and where you want us to do it. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a member of the leadership team, the ministry network or the staff team, can you stand? Leadership team, ministry network, staff team. Can you stand? Now, for some of you this morning, as we've been sitting, you've become aware that God has highlighted to you that at this moment in time, in terms of the church community or the wider community, you're doing not as much as God wants you to be doing. For others of you this morning... 
Uh, you've just been aware that God has been just touching your life and saying, well, actually, no, you, you, you've been doing this, but it's time to be doing that. You need to talk to somebody and have somebody pray with you. Not, not now, at this moment in time, though if you want to do that, that's fine. But these people you see standing here, you can grab any of these people and talk to them and say to them, can we have a coffee together? Can we go to McDonald's together? Can I come and see you? Whatever it is that works for you and talk to them and ask them to pray with you and to help you get in the place where God wants you to be doing what God wants you to do. Remember what we said earlier on, there is no place for self-sufficiency in the family. As Frank said so powerfully, I need you, you need me. So you need one another to help in this process. You can grab any of these people, either this morning, and I'd recommend this morning actually, because sometimes we can go away, we start cooking the dinner, we forget what God said to us. So you might want to grab somebody this morning and say, you know, can I meet up with you? Can we get together? We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.